Hello, everyone. Welcome to the St. Louis Art Museum's Art Speaks program. My name is Jessica Kennedy, and I'm the educator for adult learning at the museum. Before we begin, please familiarize yourself with the Q&A section located on your screen. Feel free to enter your questions at any time during the program, and we will choose a few to answer at the end. Also, there is live auto transcription available for this program. Please click the CC icon to activate or deactivate the subtitles. Today's talk is the first of a six part series in conjunction with the exhibition, Art Along the Rivers, a Bicentennial Celebration, which is now on view at the museum. For this installment, we are joined by Melissa Wolf, curator of American art and artist Norman Akers, who Melissa will introduce in a moment. Thanks so much, Melissa. Thank you, Jessica, and thank you everyone who has um, signed up to, uh, for this Art Speaks. So I want to just give a very, very quick introduction to the exhibition for those of you who maybe have not gone through yet. Um, and then I want to open the floor to Norman to talk to you about his work and then afterwards maybe a little conversation between he and I. So we wanted to do an exhibition in conjunction with the, with the Missouri State Bicentennial, but we really questioned how to do that in 2021. Um, how do we do that without um, dismissing the fact that this state came in as a slaveholding state, the fact that all states in the Union became statehood based on the removal of Native American nations. And so how do we encompass that and celebrate the objects that have come out of, out of, um, out of this history? So, two ways we did decide to do that. We go back 1,000 years to ancient Mississippians. So we go very broad outside of the 200 years of statehood. And we also pull very close. So I, we wanted Amy Torbert, who is the co-curator of this exhibition along uh, with me. She and I wanted to draw closer to really think more about our region and, and a, a shared history. We all have very different histories, but we felt that the one thing that this thousand years of, of existence shared was the land, was this very specific um, uh, region. I think of it often when I'm down on the levee walking along the Mississippi, which I love to do, that that's the same ground that a thousand years ago some Mississippian walked on, or 250 years ago a fur trader walked on, or an Osage walked on, an Osage um, person. And so it is a very shared experience in that. It's also defined very distinctly by the confluence of the three most powerful rivers in North America, the Missouri, the Mississippi, and, uh, and the Ohio. So we came up with a section, and Norman, if you want to change the slide, then we can take a look at this section. Um, Amy and I have called it, uh, for the purposes of the exhibition, There we go. We've called that area the Confluence Region. It runs uh, north from Hannibal down uh, west to Herman, and then all the way down south through Sky uh, Sykeston, across the river to Cairo, and back up on that Illinois side uh, along the river. And we felt that this was the area that was so shaped by confluence in so many different ways. We also didn't want to do the exhibition chronolo uh, chronologically. It just didn't seem as interesting. There's been exhibitions on, you know, the German culture here or on art movements, you know, University City ceramics or the St. Genevieve Art Colony. So we really wanted to think more about objects and, and to think in new ways about the objects that are associated with this region. So instead, we, um, we conceptualized the show. We divided it into five thematic sections. And nearly all of those sections include works from Mississippian to contemporary artists dealing with all dealing with those particular sections in order to see how there might be more interesting dialogues between these objects and, and tell us something new about this experience of this particular land that we all right now also share. And so, um, when we were thinking about how to, you know, we were looking at objects, we took so many trips in regional and national institutions and really got to know our, our regional partners, you know, the different institutions in, in, in the area that maybe we didn't really know. And what's most important is we learned knowledge from them, from listening to them. I'm a big believer in local knowledge and the power of that and the integrity of that. And so we 
ask people to tell us about the objects that we had and we learned so much and it informs and shapes this exhibition. We also went to our curatorial colleagues, and one of the people we talked to was our curator of Native American art, Alex Marr. And Alex had pointed us, you know, we said, well, what about contemporary artists? And he immediately pointed us to Norman. And um, I'm so glad he did, because I think Norman's work speaks so directly, both to our thematic context, to the ways in which um, objects with all different sorts of narratives can have a dialogue and can, for, and can inform each other. So with that, I want to introduce Norman and then let him introduce you um, to the narratives of, of his work and, and, and of, of his ideas. Um, Norman lives both in Oklahoma on the Osage Reservation, but also in Lawrence, Kansas, where he teaches in the School of the Fine Arts at the University of Kansas. Um, we're so excited that he agreed to present his work at this Art Speaks program um, because we knew it would speak so powerfully to the vision that Amy and I had for the exhibition. So I'll let Norman present the narrative of his art, but again, what drew us to it so strongly was the nuanced and really personal themes that consider removal and also the continuity of cultural heritage, the continuity of his art with this confluence region. So Norman, I'll go ahead and let you take the stage. Thank you, Melissa. Uh, you know, and first of all, I'd like to thank the, the St. Louis Art Museum and Amy and Alex and, and many of the people that I have had an opportunity to work with and to get to know. And as I said, this is very much an honor to be a part, you know, uh, uh, of this this exhibit and also this conversation, you know, uh, you know, regarding, you know, uh, Missouri and the history of Missouri. Um, one of the things I would like to sort of say, and I always think is really important to to talk about, is uh, is where I come from, and uh, and I'm going to show an image from from home. And, uh, and, and it's important to note that while this exhibit is about Missouri, you have to realize that the Osages, you know, were, were moved from Missouri, uh, you know, many years ago, you know, through, through a whole series of, uh, of treaties and land sessions. Um, and, and essentially this is, this is where we have ended up at. Um, uh, also just a quick note in terms of, um, of um, about Osages is that, that I'm from Gray Horse District, which is in Western Osage Reservation or, or a county, depending on how you look at it. Uh, and, and this land is, is important in the sense that it's, um, it's the tall grass prairie, it's the Flint Hills. Mm -hmm. and, and I think for, for Native peoples, one of the things that, that's so important in our lives is this kind of connection to land and place because because that really in many ways kind of forms you know um, you know our views and, and, and forms our identities uh, and even in a landscape like this you know what you see is this relationship between earth and sky and uh, and I'll be talking about that and you'll sort of see that relationship you know evolve in my own work you know you know throughout this talk uh, but uh, but also I, I, I'm a person who tends to like to tell stories, and, and so you'll you'll find that at different times I'll sort of be expressing these stories as a means of kind of connecting my work to to real life. Um, and and I will say this I you know before I um, for I've been an art instructor for about 25 years now, and I had taught out in Santa Fe, New Mexico. And many years ago, uh, about 10 years ago, I had an opportunity to, to go to Lawrence, Kansas. And I remembered I was driving across the state of Kansas and I saw that, uh, and I went through the tall grass prairie and as I said, I immediately connected with home. Uh, and that was part of the reasoning why I, I decided to, to go to Kansas. And also it, it gave me uh, closer contact, you know, to do home as well. I think as, as an individual, there's this interesting sort of balance between, between work and home. And I think for many Native peoples, we deal with that, you know, uh, that, that kind of bridging you know, those, those, those places. Um, I, I would like to also show another image here. Um, and, uh, and, you know, one of the things I think that that's always been important, you know, for, for me, and I also, also will express this too, is that my father was Osage and my mother was Anglo. And, and so I, I really had kind of a, a mixed blood sort of 
experience growing up. Uh, but, but as I said, uh, this particular picture is uh, the lady on the, uh, uh, the left-hand side is my grandma Eva. And, and, and one of the things that I think is, is always so important for, uh, for Osage people, and we've talked about this, is that, that our ancestors and, and those people before us, you know, they put things in order. And, and I'm gonna use that word order you know, uh, you know, throughout this talk, in the sense that they put things in place to give us a good life, you know, and, and one of the things that I always like to kind of acknowledge is, is that those people before us did that, and so they made a good place for us. Um, also, just on a side note of this, um, while I'll be talking about my artwork, uh, you see just really fine examples of Osage ribbon work, you know, um, you know, in the blankets. Um, uh, what I'd like to do is move on to another image here, and um, and I want to talk a little bit about the history, um, and particularly the historic period of Osage um, land. And, and in this particular image, what we see is is this kind of um, this sort of region uh, of Missouri. Um, sort of southeast Kansas, um, uh, northeast Oklahoma, and again, south uh, or north, uh, northwest Arkansas. And so this kind of gives you a scope uh, of, of the Osage lands. Um, and basically, you know, this was just, uh, as I said, again, was our ancestral lands, you know, here. Uh, and clearly, as I said, that kind of connection to Missouri has been strong. Uh, one of the things I, I do like to kind of talk about too, you know, with this and share uh, is, is that when the Osage migrated, you know, from the east, you know, down the Ohio River, you know, to the Missouri area. Uh, and many years ago, you know, there, we were a larger group that actually splintered off. Um, and, uh, and there's uh, a number of other groups, including the, the Omaha and the Ponca, which actually moved up the Missouri River, uh, up you know, into the Nebraska area. You know? And then, uh, then the, the Quapaw actually moved down river you know, into the Arkansas area. Um, and um, and uh, the Kanza people you know, moved west you know, into the Kansas area, but the Osage pretty much stayed you know, along the Osage River, the Gasconade, you know, and that area of central, central Missouri. And, um, and so that, the other thing I, I would like to kind of express to you is, is, is that there are other names for Osage. Osage is, uh, is a corruption of, of Wajaji, you know, for the most part. And then there's another name that we use, it's called Neoklonska, which means children of, of the middle waters. Um, one of the things I also I'd like to kind of, as you see these maps, and it, uh, is, is that maps have always been important to me. And, and I'm going to kind of shift out of being a historian to, to more of an artist and talk a little bit about a few things here. Um, years ago, uh, when I was small, I, I used to collect maps. And, um, and, um, and people knew that at home. And, and so they would always bring me these maps from faraway places. And of course I kept them in a box and I would look at them and, and I would imagine kind of what these places uh, were like. Um, as a, a child growing up in a very kind of rural community, I had never really thought about the notion of world travel in a sense. And, um, and many years after that, you know, um, I started becoming more and more interested you know, you know, in, 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 in maps. Uh, and, and they also played a role, you know, in my artwork. Um, uh, these are a couple of other maps that I would like to kind of point out to you too as well. And one of the things I'm sort of interested in, you know, too with maps today is, is how they sort of um, um, are, are, are developed by cartographers and they sort of kind of illustrate, you know, the concerns and needs of people you know, at that particular time. You know, uh, uh, this old map from the 1920s of Osage County, you know, what we see is, 
is a, a series of, uh, of rivers and streams, creeks, um, and also the railroad. Uh, and then too, if you look a little bit closer, you see, um, see, you know, Pasuli and Wahakali and Shanzoli, uh, which are the three villages, basically Grey Horse, uh, Pahuska, and Hominy villages. And, uh, and the map itself is, is, is quite sparse. Um, and then when you look at the map next to it, you know, uh, from the 1990s, what we see is this overlay. Uh, of towns, you know, of roads, of reservoirs. Um, and, and again, you see this kind of uh, transition sort of being illustrated in the landscape. Um, you know, as I said, we, we look at maps as a means of guiding us from one place to another. But also these maps are documents of colonialism, you know, for native peoples. You know, when you think about this, and I've heard this said, uh, in the past that maps are, are really kind of, you know, were one of the more important or sort of more sort of destructive ways of kind of removing people, native peoples from their land. And um, uh, what also strikes me about this particular map is, is that at, at the top of it, right here, it says Osage Indian Reservation. And this was an old Rand McNally map. And then a few years later, it said, you know, like uh, Osage Tribe. Uh, and I start to realize that the naming of places, you know, uh, in these maps, you know, begins to kind of change. Um, move on to another image here. Um, you know, as I said, I, I, I moved to, to Lawrence, Kansas uh, a little over 10 years ago. And one of the things that as a native person, I'm constantly moving back and forth between between Lawrence and the Osage Reservation, you know, and it's a situation when family says, you know, you need to be home or, or we're doing something, as I said, you know, pending my job obligations, I said I usually try to make that trip back. Uh, but I traveled down this road, Highway 99 in Kansas, and it's sort of uh, apparently it, it kind of follows the, the tall grass prairie and the Flint Hills. And, uh, and 99 is kind of like an umbilical cord that, that takes me home as I'm moving across that land. And one of the things that begins to happen, you know, uh, when I get closer to that border, um, I see a sign that says, uh, leaving Kansas and come back again. And then, uh, just a little bit after that, there's another sign that says, welcome to Oklahoma, Native America. You know, and of course, Oklahoma's changed their, their, their tourist logo now. So Native America is not on that sign anymore. Um, then you see another sign that says, you are entering the Osage Nation Reservation and also welcome to Osage County. Um, and at that moment during the travels, you know, all of a sudden I become really aware of the history of removal. You know, and um, and also at the same time, the other thing that happens is I'm realizing that you know there are still people who are trying to sort of name this place that we call home in many ways. So all these kind of political entities vying, you know, for 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 this said kind of naming and a uh, place, and um, and as I said, that becomes you know sort of a concern to me. Um, one of the things that happens a lot of times, you know, growing up in a rural community, um, as 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 a young person, we drove around, we traveled, you know, gravel roads, and that was part of how we kind of entertained ourselves. And uh, and that first image that I showed you of the Osage land um, uh, is right along the border of uh, of Kansas and Oklahoma, and uh, in many of my trips home. You know, I found that uh, I could actually hop on a gravel road up in Kansas and and get get to home, the town where I live, just crossing one major highway. And what caught me, you know, caught my attention about that was is that there was none of this signage. There was no reminder of removal. You know, there was no reminder of these place names. It was just seamless. It was grassland and hills. And uh, all of a sudden, the sense of home, the sense of place became much bigger. 
you know, and I do think this is an issue, you know, for that, um, that concerns me is, is that, that sometimes we begin to think that this reservation that we live on, you know, is just our home, but for Osages, it's an expansive place. And, and that was one of the beauties about being a part of this exhibit was is that that it sort of recognizes and kind of acknowledges Osage presence, you know, in Missouri, you know, as well. And and, and that was uh, that was really, you know, really sort of quite, you know, quite exciting. And um, I'm going to move on to another image. Uh, now I'm going to kind of talk a little bit more about painting and, and sort of, uh, and what you're seeing here is, is um, is an old painting from uh, from the 1990s, and also I, I, just to give you a little bit more background information on this, um, uh, you know, one thing that sort of fascinates me is this notion of lived experience and oral stories, but also, you know, I. I, I went to school and achieved a master's degree in painting so i'd say and i'm teaching so very much a part of my life is also academia and um and i particularly with this image i remembered seeing um uh, i was at the university of illinois and i was going through uh, the library and i came across these uh, smithsonian reports and I found uh, some of francis lafleche's writings and also uh, dorsey's writings and, and they basically were, were talking about Osage religion, you know, mythology and that. And, and what struck me about, about those writings was is that um, it was sort of new information for me. You know, I always think about, you know, those people before us sort of put us in a place that we can learn. But the culture is an accumulation of information over time. And one of the things that I remembered was, is that, you know, Genesis is one of the first creation stories that I had heard. And, um, and, and, you know, and I was have to, and I have to admit, I was unfamiliar with this sort of Osage creation story. And, and so this information, as I said, you know, you know, kind of caught my interest. And, and there was this relationship between being connected, but also not knowing. And, um, and, and, um, and having to kind of deal with that, you know, and I'm going to talk a little bit more about this painting collision of heavenly structures because it kind of sets a framework for, for a lot of my other work later. Um, Two is, is that that this particular piece is uh, is a little over 80 inches by by 70. And it actually took about a year and a half to paint. It started off as a horizontal. Um, uh, kind of landscape and then it evolved you know into to this work and um, and one of the things that sort of intrigued me about it was is that at, at that same time as you can see the image to to the um, you know to the right that the symbolic diagram of the Osage you know I, I came across that and I was wanting to somehow incorporate it into my work but, but there was, you know, this other element about being honest, you know, is, is that as I looked at that diagram, I didn't understand it, you know, and, uh, and I started thinking about this and I went, my grandma Eva, my father and myself, if we were to look at this image, each of us would have a, an understanding of it that would connect us to that, to that, that image and also that story. Uh, but each of us would see it a little bit differently in the context of our time and our experience. Um, and so, so in the collision of heavenly structures painting, one of the things I was dealing with was this notion of, of it being sort of chaos and, and sort of, and I don't want to use the word broken because I think broken implies, you know, something a little bit different. But in a sense, it's moving, it's active, there, and, and, and something's beginning to transform, you know, in the work. And, and clearly, you see these Western art history sort of references, you know, to expressionist painting. There's sort of a kind of a reference to Picasso a little bit in the upper right-hand part of the painting, but, but also what you're seeing, and also a reference to cave painting um, in the, uh, the figure to the right. But, but if you look closer to this, 
you know, at this, you, you see the sun, the moon, the rivers, you see that red oak tree or that tree trunk, you know, there, you know, which, um, and those boxes, which become, you know, which are coming from that, that particular uh, diagram. And, and so, so this work was um, also kind of a, a revelation. And one of the things as a painter that always fascinates, and as an artist that fascinates me, is this notion of not knowing. That, that sometimes, you know, when you're, you're, you're making a work, you enter this place of just uncertainty. And, um, and that's actually when these beautiful things begin to happen, you know, you know in, in, in making work. And, um, and I, I will share this little story too, is, is that at that time when I was at the University of Illinois, um, um, I was going to school with a colleague, um, who she was very much a political activist and we would have conversations about activism. And, and I would always kind of tell her, I said, I'm not really uh, a political activist. I'm not a political painter. And, and yet, you know, when I finished this painting and it, you know, it was funny, she kind of looked at me and she went, oh yeah, you're a political painter. And, uh, and it sort of, you know, it kind of hit home. And, and, and part of this thing I'll, I'll sort of say too is, is, you know, when you think about Native peoples, you know, we have a CDIB card, you know, or an enrollment card. I mean, we're one of the only groups of people that they measure our sort of blood in many ways in, in terms of degrees. And, and so, you know, the reality is, is that, that our lives are politicized you know, in many ways. And so, so this, this was kind of a piece that began to, to kind of start that kind of connection, you know, with my work. One of the things I do want to say, and I want to kind of express this and be very clear, is, is that, that uh, I do look at a number of sort of creation stories, you know, from home, you know, and particularly, you know, the, from the diagram. But there's also another story uh, that's related to the elk and the formation of, of earth and land, a place for us to live. Um, I, I'm not interested in illustrating these stories. And I think that's an important thing to, to kind of consider because the notion of reading these stories from these reports and simply making a painting still keeps that, that painting kind of in the past. And I'm much more interested, you know, in, in a sense, uh, interpreting them, allowing them to, to sort of transform, you know, in many ways. Um, and and so, so I tend to think about this relationship between the past, you know, and the present, you know, and, and in many ways too, these investigations are also, you know, about trying to find a future place you know, in a sense, and I'm really sort of intrigued with that, you know, one of the things that that kind of caught my attention, and particularly if you've ever looked at Francis LaFleche's um, research on, on the Osage people, is, is that he amassed an incredible amount of, uh, of written material, uh, and it's just, just an absolutely unbelievable amount, but, but in the the sayings that he recorded and everything, what you, you, you realize is that, that these narratives um, were put in place to kind of help us understand the world that we live in. And, um, and, um, and I tend to think of this too, is that, that this is not like once upon a time, that, that the paintings that I'm working with are simply trying to understand my place in the world you know, today as, as an Osage person and uh, um, as well. I'm going to move on to another image here. Uh, this is a piece called uh, Eustace's New Suit. And, uh, and it's, a, uh, uh, it's a fairly large scale painting. You know, th there's a sense of, um, of, um, of, of, uh, you know, you, you, you see the light, the dark, you see the earth, the sky. Um, you also sort of see uh, this drum that's in the center. Uh, some of the other symbolic elements that you see uh, in that dark area is a casino, a Jarvik 7 artificial heart, 
But the central figure, you see this suit and you see the stag's head with, with the cross or a crucifix. And it makes a reference to, to St. Eustace or St. Hubert, the, the patron saint of hunters. And, um, and, um, and I think about how Osage has embraced, you know, Christianity, you know, as, as well as our own tribal religion too. And, and that's, that's, you know, I think an important thing to note, you know, here. But, but also, you know, this painting is also kind of like a warning painting. You know, it's, uh, you know, the fact that we kind of moved away from hunting, you know, in a sense gathering, you know, and now you think about casinos, which, uh, which are also an important sort of in income, you know, for, for, for tribes. Um, and so, so this work is kind of playing off of all of that. Um, I've utilized a drum in the piece and, and I'll have to say sometimes it, it was probably the most difficult thing that I painted because the notion of a broken drum, you know, kind of indicates that something's wrong. And I know at home, a lot of times we'll talk and we'll make a reference to the drum as sort of grandfather and, and looking at that. But, but again, this is a particular painting that, that kind of focuses, you know, on that notion of narrative and, um, and um, from there. Um, this is a work called Okisa. And, um, and, um, and Okisa is a little town on, uh, you know, in between Pahaska and Bartlesville, Oklahoma. And, uh, and Okisa um, kind of caught my attention. And, and uh, I'm gonna say it a little bit differently, Okitse, which is the Osage word and, and or, or pronunciation of it. And basically what it means is halfway. And, and I'm really interested in this notion of halfway. Um, you know, as a, as a professional, um, you know, I've always had to live away from home, you know, to make a living. And as I said earlier, as, as I'm making these trips back and forth. And so there's always that sense about being in between places. Um, and then also, you know, you think about that relationship between earth and sky. You know, and to me, when I'm looking at that horizon that's off in a distance, that's a place that just kind of amazes me because it's um, it's beyond my physical eyesight. I can't see, but I know that there's things that exist there. And, and the invisible is something that intrigues me. Uh, if you've ever had to walk through grass in the tall grass prairie, you also realize that there's things close by that you don't see because the grass obscures it. And, and so, so this kind of notion of about halfway, you know, is, is important. Um, also what you see in this painting, and one of the things that, that is important to note is that over the years I've developed uh, this sort of personal symbology that comes from a lot of different sources. It comes from stories from home, but it also comes from popular culture. Um, and also I, I'm sometimes making art historical references as well. Um, and in particular, this image, you see that, that tree trunk, that, that's sort of uh, kind of connected back to that diagram. And, um, and, but it's floating in between places, you know, its branches have been cut, the roots have been severed, and so they, it's sort of hovering, you know, um, you know there. But, but this was also one of the first paintings that I actually you know, physically painted a map in, and you see the landscape, you see the roads. Um, you know, to me, a lot of my paintings are also about journeys and traveling and moving from one place, you know, to, to another. And that even kind of echoes a little bit of that creation story where Osage is talking about how people came down from the sky and there were people on earth, you know, that, that we kind of made that connection. Um, you also see other images like the top, you know, um, and, and, and I'll just share a quick little story with the top. I remember when I, I was trying to think, well, what would be a good life symbol, for instance, in my painting? And I, and I remembered as a child, I would play with these little wood tops. And, you know, a top spins really fast when you, you start it, you know, and it has that kind of energy and, and that a young child 
would have. But there's a certain point it begins to wobble a little bit and then it finally hits the ground and it sort of ceases to move. And, 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 and so, so that's, that's kind of a little bit of an explanation of, of that. The other thing too is I tend to work with are, are acorns and acorns are sort of about you know moving forward or rebirth and again kind of connecting to the red oak tree in 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 that that, that creation story um so i'm going to talk about this is another painting it's called okisa 2 and, and one of the things that i i kind of want to stress particularly about this work is is that that you know i, I, I you know to me it's an important painting because it really kind of defines an Osage sense of place. You know, the first thing on a formal level, what we see is layering. We see a reference to the physical landscape of, uh, of, uh, of home. You know, we see uh, the map, you know, and it, um, you know, which sort of acknowledges colonialism you know, and how, you know, and that overlay. And then also you see this elk, you know, which is sort of calling out. And, um, uh, you know, I'm not going to go into the, the creation stories in, in a lot of detail, but, but there's an interesting, you know, there was a, a story that talks about when the earth was covered with water and, and that the elk called up on the winds and it, and, um, and it sort of blew this, this water up into a mist. And, and we basically ended up with, with, with dry land to live upon. But, but as I kept on thinking about the elk as a central character, you know, in, in, you know, in that, that particular narrative, I also started realizing it was symbolic of land, you know, and in the story, it talks about how the, the antlers and the tines, you know, became the rivers. Um, uh, the back and different points of the back became the hills you know, that, that we see. Um, and then also the hair in this struggle, and, and it was very much a struggle, you know, that was kind of connect, connected with this creation, was mixed in with the mud and it became grass. And so what you do is you, you see the physical landscape, you see the map that suggests colonialism, and you see the elk, which is, is sort of a mythic representation you know, of land all be combined, you know, into to a painting. And, you know, and, and in a sense, this is almost like an act of sovereignty as an Osage person, I'm beginning to define the land on, on my own terms, you know, here. Um, I'm gonna move on to another image. Uh, one of the other things that, that's very significant about my, my art practice is I do a lot of printmaking. And the printmaking offers me the opportunity to, 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 to develop images a little bit quicker. You know, I always think about this is that painting is a very lonely activity. You know, when I'm painting, I'm not around anybody. Uh, but when I'm printmaking or I'm working in a print shop, I, I tend to work with, with printers. And so, so it's a more, little bit more communal. Uh, and also one of the things about prints is that, as, as I said a moment ago, it kind of allows me to generate more and more images and kind of get out of the box. Um, uh, this is a particular image that I wanted to show you, and it's just uh, the people on island which have been discovered, and it's a German woodcut from 1505. And, and uh, when I came across this image, you know, it, 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 it just it captivated me. I mean, and first of all, it's of the Tiano people and the, actually the Caribbean. But, but when you look at it, you see the feathered headdresses, you know, um, you see these groupings of figures, the, the two men, you know, on the right, kind of, you know, consoling each other. You see the leader, you know, with his bow and his, his, his hand kind of, you know, over his heart, uh, the mother, the child, you know, you see the lustful couple, and, and also you see these acts of cannibalism. And, and that, you know, as I said, um, you know, as I said, really, as I said, you know, began to make me kind of think about this, this print in other ways. Also, when you look at the composition and how everything is, is organized, you know, on the picture plane, it's very Western, you know, 
there's almost nothing that really kind of relates. You know, it's, it's a European view of native peoples. You know, and clearly these things such as the feathered headdress and cannibalism were sort of stereotypes that have sort of um, existed all the way up to today in many cases. Uh, but I, as a, a native person, I kept on thinking, well, what's the most important aspect about this work? And clearly it's the two ships in the background. You know, and I think one of the things that's so important for us to, to be aware of it is to be able to understand how to look at, at things from different points of view. Uh, those two ships in the background kind of acknowledge the fact that the world changed for, for native peoples in North America at that point in time. And, and so I, I tend to reference this work uh, as well as some of the Debray's uh, prints, you know, in, in a lot of the model prints and lithographs that I'm doing. Um, and I'm going to show one other sort of, sort of insight into my method. Um, you know, when I, when I think about maps is, is that, that I like the notion of, 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 of moving things around, you know, of trying to find a place, you know, the act of transforming a map or changing it is very much about trying to create another place, kind of a place that sort of fits kind of your needs. Uh, this is a little playful side of, of, of my talk is, is that I tend to, to deal, uh, I have a plastic globe that's, that I can deflate and I can fold and it's kind of therapeutic in the sense that I can move the borders and boundaries around, but I photograph it. And then I will put it into Photoshop and I'm a Luddite. I, I tend to do erase and carefully sort of take away these parts. And then this is what I end up with is these maps that are layers and you start to see the borders and the boundaries shifting around. Um, and as I said, that, that, you know, is kind of an exciting part of, of the art making process. And also when I started doing this, it made that kind of connection between the hand and technology which is still something I'm kind of negotiating. Um, this is a, a piece, uh, a small mono print that, that was done oh, roughly about maybe seven years ago, eight years ago. And it's, um, it's of um, basically they're, they're gum Arabic roll-ups. And then, um, and then we'll, we'll print this on printing paper, but offset it onto Bristol board and then use the Bristol board as, as a plate and then do reduction printing and then actually cutting out stencils that, that sit on top. But you see the birds, and you'll see the birds a lot in my, my paintings. And I remembered as a child when I would look at birds, what fascinated me was that they could navigate a space that I could not. There was an up and a down and they moved around. But also you realize that birds migrate you know, they, they move from one place to another seasonally. And, and I started thinking about how that even echoes my sort of connections back home, you know, like starting in March, I, I'm going home regularly to take care of things all the way up to June and, and that. I'm gonna move on to another piece here. Uh, this is called Alien Conquest. Um, and, um, and uh, you know, the, the first thing that, that kind of caught my attention when I was making this piece was, uh, is that yellow. And I started thinking about this yellow as kind of something that you would see on the warning signs, you know, on the highway and that. So that seemed like the appropriate color for that field. But as you look at the work, what you see is, um, is the presidents, you know, or, and some of the presidents, US historic figures that are in these, spaceships, flying saucers. And, you know, when I was even 20 years ago, I remembered people talking about the wall, you know, and creating that kind of boundary between the United States and, and Mexico. Um, and, and, and to me, you know, what I realized is that indigenous histories and peoples don't necessarily always recognize those borders you know, in a sense, and in many play times, those borders have actually kept people away and off of their own homelands in many ways. But, but also this issue about immigration, you know, has intrigued me. And, um, 
and from a native perspective, you know, we realized that that so many people had moved into, you know, and occupied in a sense our lands. Uh, but but also there's a human element that I think is really important to be aware of, and um, and hence that's why I chose to to use the figures of Washington, Hamilton, Grant, and Jackson because they come off a of U.S. currency, and uh, and you know people migrate they move, they immigrate, you know, Germans, Swedes, uh, Norwegians, people, you know, came, Irish, you know, came to the United States uh, because they wanted a better life. You know, they wanted to feed their family. They wanted to, to be free from persecution in many ways. And, um, and so that human element is something that, I, that I'm sort of, you know, intrigued with but also this is kind of a tongue-in-cheek play that that i i like to to kind of deal with you know you know in my work because i mean clearly there there are more serious issues with this let me move on to another piece here this is a dark rain and, and it pretty much echoes you know many of the things that um um that i said have said about the other work um I'm going to move on to a, a few larger paintings here. And this is just called Interference and a Tiny Spot of, of Hope. Uh, a number of years ago, a company came in and built windmills on our land. And, uh, and it was, you know, it, from my perspective, it was a very kind of discouraging, you know, that kind of relationship between earth and sky that I sort of experienced in that particular region was um, was sort of uh, abrupted by these windmills. And even when the, the rotors turn, what you see is it feels like they're almost cutting into the earth, you know, and that kind of distraction, you know, again, was a little bit unsettling. You know, and of course I flipped the elk upside down and you see this kind of turmoil. Um, um, there's also some references to bones and a little bit of pottery and that kind of in, in the background there. You know, one of the things that has always struck me about, uh, about the Midwest, and, and we see this particularly in Missouri too, is, is that, you know, there's such, you know, a rich ancient culture that, that has sort of been buried, you know, and, and the Midwest and the landscape changes quite a bit, you know, through agriculture, it's been farmed, it's been plowed, uh, but, but it, that, that history is sort of buried, you know, in that land. Uh, and again, that's something I, I, tend, to, I tend to reference. Um, we'll move on to another piece here. This is called Crying Elk. Uh, this was actually done right at the beginning of COVID, you know, and in that period, and I had been working on this painting, and and I wasn't quite for sure how to to wrap it up. And then COVID, you know, was was kind of taking a grip on the country, you know, at that time. And uh, and so the, this this elk character that I'm working with that sort of symbolizes land and kind of identity, you know, is shedding tears, and and we see, you know. Um, these kind of references to the trees that have been cut, you know, these paintings are kind of moving a little bit more towards environmental issues. And then uh, I'm going to move on to, to one more piece, which is um, Dripping World, which is, is been showcased in the, um, in, in the exhibition Art Along the Rivers and, um, and this particular painting, you know, uh, clearly is about environmental issues. You know, we, we see the, the pipeline, the oil spill. We sort of see this dripping world, which is a new symbol for me. Um, again, these layers, the maps, these, these red and sort of gray circles that you're seeing, our orbs are, are kind of connected back to water, water molecules and, of course, the snapping turtle. And, um, and, uh, and to me, it's kind of a new information for paintings, but also at the same time, it's old, you know, uh, too, because, because it's connecting back to these, these things that I've kind of dealt with, you know, in the past, the elk and the map. Um, and anyway, um, this is pretty much uh, my slideshow at this point. 
um, and then I'm going to uh, to stop share, and then I think we can move on to the, the Actually, next. Actually, Norman, if you wouldn't mind leaving that up, um, just in okay. case we need to refer to something, a question. Yes, please. Okay. Thank you. And actually, so Norman, I'll I'll start the questions. I see we have a few or one in the in the um, Q and A, but I I have a basic question. You came to the opening and then mm -hmm. you stayed for several days, which was so lovely um, to see you see the painting there, <laughs> which is just a really wonderful moment. And but also you walked through the exhibition and you spent quite a bit of time in the exhibition. So I'm wondering now that you've walked us through your work and you've walked through our work or my work and Amy's work as curators. I wonder if you can talk about resonances you find between your work or you personally and the, the concepts of the exhibition or the themes in the exhibition. You know, the first thing that kind of caught my attention about walking through there was the acknowledgement of other peoples. You know, and, and the fact that, that you know, I, I, I was seeing you know, references to indigenous peoples, you know, even the World's Fair, when you were looking at the inclusion of that work. But, but that was my, my most immediate response. You know, the other thing that, that struck me about, about the exhibit, and you kind of talk about this confluence, you know, and, and this notion of that Missouri is this place where things kind of move from people moving through and across. And um, of that land, and and I think in, in terms of, in in terms of my own work, you know, it, it, it is very much about that movement. You know, it's about that history. It's about the the, the past, the present, you know, and the future. And, and in many ways, when I was going through that exhibit, that was one of the things that that caught my attention. You know, uh, Matatope's robe. You know, when we look at it, and we think it was the Upper Missouri. You know, and, and but but it still acknowledges that river moving through, through through the Missouri region. You know, the state of Missouri. You know, and that and, and so that sense of movement was was something that that really kind of caught my my attention. Uh, on a sort of a maybe a broader note too is I, I kept on looking at at the works in there. Is is that that you saw a real sense of. Um, of wealth and trade, you know, as we was looking at the objects, it was just one of those things that, that, that it sort of showed the richness. And when I say the word richness, I'm not talking about monetary, you know, I'm talking about cultural, you know, social. And, and, and that was, I think, the really exciting part about, about the exhibit. And as you sort of said, it wasn't this chronology you know, uh, of the history of Missouri, but, but there was something about going through there that, that, it, that I started to get a sense of this wholeness. Yeah, and that it's the dialogues, right? And it's the, the shared sort of experience. And in fact, you know, what I would hope maybe that we could sort of think about experiences within the exhibition as one of trade as well, right? A trade of our own experiences with, those that we encounter in the exhibition, right? That it's a that it's an actual experiential experiential. Yeah, well, I, I so. think that 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 concept of trade, you know, in the sense of trade of ideas, mm -hmm. trade of experiences, is 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 you know is present, and, and it also echoes that whole history back because you think about the shotos and the fur trade, you know, and, and it's just a building on that kind of sense. Yeah, we do have one question, we have time, um, and it's by Diane Beckman, and she's asking to hear more about the role of the elk in Osage culture, and she asks what the Osage term might be, and she also wondered about the Jarvik heart and why it was included. The Jarvik heart? Jarvik heart, okay. The Jarvik heart. You don't know what it is. You know, um, the Jarvik heart was just a real early symbol I started using. I mean, and I like the fact that it was an artificial heart. You know, it was man-made. And, and there was a, a point in time in my own art practice, I, I was starting to kind of question this notion of spirituality, uh, but also loss of spirituality, you know, in a sense. And, and that kind of dialogue 
that happened. And I remembered I, I read an a interview of, of Barney, that Barney Clark did. And he was one of the first recipients of the, the artificial heart. And one of the things that he said that struck me was he, he said, uh, when he saw his children, his grandchildren, that he got excited in his mind, but his heart didn't race. It stayed the same beat. You know, and and to me that that was really fascinating. But it was also it's a vessel too, you know, as well as the heart is a vessel, and and blood moves through this this way. But 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 to me that particular image and, and it being referenced in the um, in the Eustace's new suit painting, you know, was was also about this kind of loss, you know. Uh, too as well and that balance between the spiritual or not spiritual you know and looking at that and I think those kind of plays you know are very much a part you know I used to play more of a role in my earlier work um, and um, and then you know the elk itself in in terms of those stories you know it's it's um, as I said they're fairly long stories and you're going to get various different versions of them you know, to, you know, but, but you know, the, the central reason why I chose that really was because it was just, you know, kind of a, a first of all, I'll, I'll tell you that, you know, it's just a, it's a strong symbol. It's a strong visual image, you know, it's, um, and as I said, the different parts of that, like the back, the hump, the hair, mm -hmm. the antlers, you know, and, and there's some other parts here to that that make a reference back to land but here's another thing too about the elk is that the elk was indigenous to missouri at one time you know and through progress the elk got moved out just like the osages got moved out you know i have and, one oh sorry go ahead and you think about elk being sort of put on nature reserves <laughs> <laughs> so i i have I, can't, I know I don't have time to ask it, but one of the things I'm just that you made me think about is your own travel to the museum, to yeah. this part of Missouri, to see your show in an exhibition. Like, how do you see that in terms of you talking about traveling across homeland and across that beautiful uh, tall grass prairie in between your work and your own home? Did that bring out any thoughts when you were making that travel to here and back home? You know, it does. It does. I mean, you know, just traveling across Missouri in general, there's this connection to to home. You know, for the most part, there, there's one thing that always kind of intrigues me, and and is that that sometimes when I'm moving from one place to another, and and I sort of see or I become aware of of a, of a significant landmark. You know something that hasn't changed in a in a couple of hundred years is that in the back of my head I keep on thinking oh, my ancestors saw that. Yeah, I feel that way when we picked our region, right? I have a connection to that, and that's that's always important. You know, and sometimes even when you're looking at at how the landscape has changed, you know, even with 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 farming, you know, and that occasionally you'll see an anomaly. You know on that landscape that that you know hasn't been touched and, and it has a certain sort of significance that that you, you can't help but think that someone acknowledged that as a landmark as they moved you know across that space that's beautiful that's beautiful well i know we're out of time norman this was just absolutely fabulous and we're so grateful that we have your work in the exhibition and like i said it just seemed like an epitome, you know, or an, an, an exemplar of, of what we really wanted in the exhibition. So I thank you so much for agreeing to talk. Oh, and you're welcome. Jessica, did you have any ending here? Uh, yeah, um, thank you. I just want to say thank you to both of you for doing this today. And thanks to everyone who joined us. Um, I do want to let everyone know that, as I said at the beginning, this is just the start of a series. Um, and programs will take place on the next five Thursdays starting at noon and they will feature Melissa um, and her co-curator Amy Torbert. 
uh, and they will be focusing on each thematic section in the exhibition. Um, so I hope that you're all able to join us for some or all of those. Um, I also want to encourage everyone um, to register for the virtual Donald Danforth Jr. Lecture on Native American art that's happening this Saturday, October 9th at 11 a.m. Uh, the lecture is titled Native Collections, Past, Present, and Future, and will be given by Joe D. Horse Capture from the Autry Museum of the American West. Um, you can register for all of these programs and more um, on slam.org slash events. So thanks again, Norman and Melissa, and I hope everyone has a great day. Thanks, guys. Thanks.